10 Strange Facts About Jack the Ripper. It is inevitable that a case such as the White Chapel murders should result in some mysterious twists, bizarre turns, and spooky coincidences. So in this video, we are going to reveal 10 strange facts about Jack the Ripper. The Funeral of Mary Nichols The murder of Mary Ann Nichols took place in the early hours of the morning of Friday the 31st of August 1888 in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, and it caused a great deal of excitement in the district. So much so that when her funeral took place the following Thursday, the 6th of September, 1888, the authorities were anxious to prevent the crowds that were gathering in the streets from disrupting the proceedings. One of the first problems to confront them was removing the body from the mortuary in Old Montague Street to the undertakers in Hanbury Street without attracting the attention of the mob. The funeral directors therefore set in motion a ruse which bizarrely and coincidentally appears to have predicted not only the name of the next victim, but also the location of her murder. A horse-drawn hearse was observed making its way down Hanbury Street and the crowds which, according to newspaper reports, numbered some thousands, made way for it to go along Old Montague Street. But instead of so doing, it passed on into Whitechapel Road and then doubling back, it reached the mortuary by the back gate which was situated in Chapman's Court. The ruse appears to have worked for only the undertaker and his men were present as the coffin was carried out of the mortuary, placed on the hearse and taken to the undertaker's premises on Hanbury Street. How does this appear to have predicted the next victim and the location of the murder? Well, the coffin was taken from the mortuary's back door in Chapman's Court and removed to the undertaker's premises on Hanbury Street. Two days later, Annie Chapman the second victim of Jack the Ripper, would be murdered in Hanbury Street. Photographing the victim's eyes An oft-reported fact concerning the police investigation into the Jack the Ripper murders is that the police actually photographed the eyes of the victims in the hope that they would see the face of Jack the Ripper preserved upon their retinas. Optography, or the idea that the eyes were able to record the last image that a person saw before death, was a widespread and popular science in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. One of the earliest mentions that it might be used in the hunt for the White Chapel murderer appeared in the Star newspaper on Thursday the 13th of September 1888 in relation to the murder of Annie Chapman. The article read, Among the many suggestions made to the police is one urging that the pupils of the murdered woman's eyes should be photographed on the chance of the retina retaining an image of the murderer capable of reproduction. Whether the police actually did photograph the eyes of any of the victims is uncertain, and only one police officer ever claimed that this was the case. Walter Dew was a young detective who was based at Commercial Street Police Station in 1888. On the morning of Friday the 9th of November, he was one of the first officers to arrive at number 13 Miller's Court, the scene of the murder of Jack the Ripper's final victim, Mary Kelly. In his autobiography, published many years later, he recalled the most striking memory of the scene that greeted him inside the tiny room. The mental picture of that sight which remains most vividly with me is the poor woman's eyes. They were wide open and seemed to be staring straight at me with a look of terror. 
Later in his memoirs, he claimed that Mary Kelly's eyes had indeed been photographed. I have told you about the eyes of Mary Kelly, wide open and staring in death. To someone, those eyes suggested a possible clue. There was at the time a widespread superstition that the retina of a murdered person's eyes would, if photographed, give a picture of the last person upon whom the person had looked. I do not for a moment think that the police ever seriously expected the photograph of the murderer to materialise, but it was decided to try the experiment. Several photographs of the eyes were taken by expert photographers with the latest type cameras. The result was negative. But the very fact that this forlorn hope was tried shows that the police, in their eagerness to catch the murderer, were ready to follow any clue and to adopt any suggestion, even at the risk of being made to look absurd. It should be noted that the only source for this story is Walter Dew himself, and he was writing many years after the murders, and there is a possibility that he may have exaggerated his actual involvement in the investigation and his knowledge of the crimes and the methods adopted by the investigating officers. However, the idea that the police may have photographed one of the victim's eyes soon became a widely circulated urban myth, and it still pops up from time to time. In the 1988 miniseries Jack the Ripper, starring Michael Caine, for example, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, turns up at Miller's Court, where he remarks to Inspector Frederick George Aveline, The eyes of a dead person retain the last thing they've seen. That's what I've heard. The photographer's brought a special lens, just in case it's true. Did Catherine Eddowes know who the killer was? In September 1888, Catherine Eddowes and her lover, John Kelly, had made their annual journey to Kent in order to earn money picking hops. Unfortunately, thanks to the unusually wet summer of 1888, the hop yield had been disappointing and unable to find much work, they had returned to London, arriving back in the capital on the afternoon of Friday the 28th of September, 1888. That night they split up and John Kelly went to a lodging house, whereas Catherine said she would seek a bed in the Shoe Lane casual ward. On Saturday the 13th of October, 1888, a story appeared in the East London Observer which suggests that Catherine may have known the identity of the killer and may have put herself in danger. The story read, A reporter gleaned some curious information from the casual ward superintendent of Mile End regarding Kate Eddowes, the Mitre Square victim. She was formerly well known in the casual ward there, but had disappeared for a considerable time until the Friday preceding her murder, Asking the woman where she had been in the interval, the superintendent was met with the reply that she had been in the country hopping. But, added the woman, I have come back to earn the reward offered for the apprehension of the Whitechapel murderer. I think I know him. Mind he doesn't murder you too, replied the superintendent jocularly. Oh, no fear of that was the remark made by Kate Eddowes as she left. Within four and twenty hours afterwards, she was a mutilated corpse. Jack the Ripper's Black Bag The body of Elizabeth Stride was found at 1am on the morning of Sunday the 30th of September 1888 in Dutfield's Yard, alongside the International Working Men's Educational Club in Berners Street. Around 30 minutes before the discovery of the body, Mrs Fanny Mortimer had been standing outside her house at number 36 Berners Street, three doors along from the International Working Men's Educational Club, when she saw a young man come hurrying down Berners Street from the direction of Commercial Road. As she watched, he looked up at the club and then hurried around the next corner. 
Mrs. Mortimer then went back indoors, only to be brought out later by the commotion in the aftermath of the finding of the body in Duckfield's yard. Later that day, she told a journalist that the only person she had seen in the street was the man with the shiny black bag. Her statement received widespread publicity and was greatly embellished in the months and even the years that followed. Reminiscing in his memoirs 50 years later, Walter Dew, a detective who had worked on the case, would credit Mrs Mortimer with being the only person ever to see the Ripper in the vicinity of one of his crimes. It seems evident, however, that Walter Dew was either misremembering or had been influenced by later embellishments of this widely circulated story. Furthermore, it would appear that he was not kept particularly well informed by his superiors, for Mrs Mortimer had most definitely not seen the Ripper in the vicinity of one of his crimes. Leon Goldstein was horrified when he heard local gossip about the suspicious-looking man seen hurrying away from the scene of the murder, carrying a shiny black bag. He had, he told the police when he walked into Lehman Street Police Station the next day, left a coffee house in Spectacle Alley only a short time before Mrs Mortimer's sighting, and he had indeed hurried past her, carrying a shiny black bag full of empty cigarette boxes on his way home to nearby 22 Christian Street. Goldstein was not in any way related to the crime and was most certainly not the Whitechapel murderer. Yet his hasty dash home along Burner Street would furnish the killer with one of his most recognisable features. For although Mrs Mortimer's sighting of him received widespread press coverage, Leon Goldstein's self-identification and subsequent absolution by the police did not and thus the shiny black bag became as integral a part of the murderer's reputed apparel as the top hat and the swirling cape. A Penny to View the Murder Site The body of Annie Chapman was discovered at 6am on the morning of the 8th of September 1888 in the backyard of number 29 Hanbury Street in Spitalfields. People living in the vicinity were genuinely shocked by the horror of what had occurred in their midst. However, by the end of that day, people living on either side of the property had discovered an unforeseen benefit from the murder having occurred next door to them. As the Star newspaper reported in its evening edition, for several hours past, the occupants of the adjoining houses have been charging an admission fee of one penny to people anxious to view the spot where the body was found. Several hundreds of people have availed themselves of the opportunity, though all that can be seen are a couple of packing cases from beneath which is the stain of a blood track. Catherine Eddowes' false name. On the morning of Saturday the 29th of September, 1888, Catherine Eddowes pawned the boots of her lover, John Kelly, at a pawnbroker's shop and moneylenders on Church Street in Spitalfields. She gave her name as Jane Kelly of 6 Dorset Street. That evening, Police Constable Robinson of the City of London Police found her drunk on Aldgate High Street and he arrested her and took her to Bishopsgate Police Station. Here she was put in a cell to sober up, which she had done by midnight. At one o'clock in the morning, she was deemed sober enough to be released. On being asked for her name and address before leaving the police station, she gave a false name and said that her name was Mary Ann Kelly. So that morning she had given the pawnbroker the false name of Jane Kelly and at the police station, she had used the alias Mary Ann Kelly. The next victim of Jack the Ripper would be Mary Jane Kelly, who was murdered in Dorset Street on the 9th of November, 1888. A change of name because of Jack the Ripper. The location of the murder of Mary Ann Nichols on August the 31st, 1888, was Bucks Row in Whitechapel, 
and almost immediately Bucks Row became notorious throughout the country. It featured in numerous newspaper reports and it even became popular with sightseers who would, for several years after the murder, arrive there anxious to visit the site of the first Jack the Ripper atrocity. By 1892, the residents had had enough. They had long been ashamed of the infamy that the crime had brought to their thoroughfare. They were also, so tradition maintains, much annoyed by their postman, who used to take an almost ghoulish delight in knocking on their doors and crying out things like, Number 5, Killer's Row, I believe. They therefore raised a petition and approached the local council, asking that the name be changed to rid them of the notoriety associated with it. The council agreed to their proposal and on the 25th of October, 1892, the name was changed from Bucks Row to Durwood Street, making it the only one of the murder sites, the name of which was changed as a direct result of a Jack the Ripper crime having occurred there. Mary Kelly alive after death. One of the mysteries to confront us concerning the murder of Mary Kelly is the time at which it actually took place. The doctors who examined her body as it lay in her room at number 13 Miller's Court were of the opinion that death had taken place at some stage between 1am and 4am on the 9th of November 1888. This latter hour is certainly borne out by two of her neighbours who claimed that, that around 4am they were woken by a cry of murder. However, a curious aspect of Mary Kelly's murder is that sightings of her were reported several hours after she was supposed to have been dead. One of the more reliable witnesses who claimed to have seen her was Mrs Caroline Maxwell, the wife of a lodging house deputy at 14 Dorset Street. She said that she saw Mary Kelly standing on the corner of Miller's Court between 8am and 8.30am on the morning of the 9th of November 1888. What brings you up so early? Mrs Maxwell asked Mary. Oh, I do feel so bad, was Mary Kelly's reply. I have the horrors of drink upon me as I have been drinking for some days past. Mrs Maxwell suggested that Mary Kelly go to a local pub and have a half pint of beer. Mary told her that she had already done so, but had brought it all up again. And so saying, she pointed to some vomit in the roadway. Caroline Maxwell then went to purchase some milk from a shop on Bishopsgate, and returning at 9am, she said she saw Mary Kelly talking to a man outside the Britannia pub at the junction of Dorset Street and Commercial Street. Mrs Maxwell's statement was clearly at odds both with the doctor's opinion as to the time of Mary Kelly's death and the claims by the two neighbours that they heard a cry out at the time of her murder at 4am. Over the years, several theories have been put forward to explain the discrepancy. Some hold that Caroline Maxwell was mistaken about the day or that she was lying because she wanted her moment in the spotlight. Others argue that she mistook someone else for Mary Kelly. She did, after all, say that she had only actually spoken to Mary Kelly twice. Inevitably, it has been proffered that she saw Mary Kelly's ghost, whilst conspiracy theorists argue that she did in fact meet Mary Kelly and that the body inside 13 Miller's Court was that of someone else. Yet Caroline Maxwell's account of the meeting is consistent in both her police statement and her inquest testimony. Furthermore, the coroner at the inquest made a specific point of warning her that she was giving evidence under oath and pointing out that her testimony contradicted those of other witnesses. But Caroline Maxwell stuck to her story. Evidently, she was convinced that it was Mary Kelly she had seen between 8am and 9am on the 9th of November 1888, not somebody who looked like her or somebody who might have been wearing her clothes. Her sighting confronts us with yet another mystery and inconsistency concerning the Jack the Ripper case, and sadly it is a mystery that is destined now to never be solved. Men dressed as women to catch Jack the Ripper 
One of the intriguing aspects of the Jack the Ripper case is the number of disguises that various people employed in their endeavours to catch the killer. From fairly early on in the investigation, police officers in plain clothes were deployed on the streets of the area in the hope that they would be able to glean vital information that might lead to the apprehension of the perpetrator of the Whitechapel murders. However, the popular perception was that people could always tell the plainclothes men by their military gait and the fact that they often wore their policemen's boots, no matter what their disguise. Journalists also took to the streets wearing all manner of disguises, hoping that they would be able to obtain scoops for their newspapers. As for the type of disguises that were adopted, well, dressing up as women in order to try and attract the attention of the murderer was up there with the best of them. More than one man would find himself in an embarrassing situation when he was caught out on the streets of Whitechapel dressed in female attire. In the wake of the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, a newspaper reporter decided that he would make a serious attempt to land the murderer once and for all. Unfortunately, things didn't quite go according to plan. The Press Association told the story of what happened. On Monday morning, a newspaper reporter, who has been on the lookout for the murderer for several nights past, thinking it quite possible that, after the cool audacity of the murders of Sunday, he might possibly repeat the murder during Monday morning, shaved off his whiskers and moustache, and dressing himself as a woman, walked from his home in Leytonstone to Whitechapel and made the tour of the streets frequented by the assassin, passing several detectives and constables on the way. He was unmolested until after he had covered a great deal of ground. Upon getting into Whitechapel Road again, however, he was pounced upon by Police Constable Ludwig, who said, Stop! You are a man! Seeing that it was useless to deny it, the reporter admitted the fact, upon which he was asked, Are you one of us? He answered to the negative, and he explained to the officer why the disguise had been adopted. The constable, however, said that he must take the reporter to the police station, and he was accordingly conveyed to Lehman Street, where the inspector on duty, after several questions, said, I must detain you until inquiries are made. After a delay of about an hour and a half, the officer was satisfied of the reporter's bona fides, and he was liberated. Constable Ludwig's asking the reporter, Are you one of us? suggests that there may well have also been plainclothes police officers out on the streets disguised as women, although this was never officially confirmed. We do, however, know of at least one policeman who most certainly did don female attire in his attempts to catch Jack the Ripper. In the early hours of the morning of Tuesday the 8th of October, 1888, Detective Sergeant John Robinson of the Metropolitan Police's G Division was approached by some Italians on Air Street Hill in Clerkenwell and informed that a man who answered the description of the Whitechapel murderer had been seen in the company of a woman who had hastily left him. They told the police officer that the man had entered a cab yard in Phoenix Place in Clerkenwell. Sensing an opportunity to run the perpetrator of the East End atrocities to ground, the plucky Sergeant Robinson borrowed a woman's hat and a mantle, sadly the newspaper didn't reveal who he borrowed the clothing from, and went in search of the suspicious man. Robinson entered the cab yard and hid himself behind some cabs so that he could keep an eye out and hopefully apprehend the suspect should he appear. Unfortunately for him, the sight of a man wearing a woman's hat and cloak, hiding in the shadows, attracted the attention of several cab washers and they approached the detective demanding to know what he was up to. Robinson told them that he was a police officer and asked them to go away, which they did. But then two other cab washers, James Phillips and William Jarvis, approached him and asked, What are you messing about here for? Robinson whipped off his woman's hat and informed them that he was a police officer, whereupon Jarvis punched him. Robinson seized Jarvis by the coat and, in the subsequent scuffle, Jarvis drew a pocket knife and stabbed the officer above the left eye. The detective drew his truncheon from under his mantle and went to strike Jarvis on the hand. However, he missed and instead struck him a heavy blow across the head. 
At this point, several other officers and members of the public intervened, and Jarvis and Phillips were taken into custody. Sadly, the suspect, whom Robinson was keeping under surveillance, used the confusion to make good his escape. At their subsequent court appearance on Tuesday the 30th of October 1888, Jarvis would be sentenced to six weeks in prison, whilst Phillips would be acquitted. And as for the plucky Detective Robinson, well, it doesn't seem to have struck anyone to ask him why he opted to disguise himself as a woman in order to apprehend the suspect. Nor, for that matter, did any of the journalists covering the subsequent trial of the two men at which Robinson gave evidence reveal what outfit the detective chose to wear to court. Dr Bernardo met Elizabeth Stride just before her murder. The murder of Elizabeth Stride had taken place on the 30th of September, 1888. On the 9th of October, Dr Thomas Bernardo wrote to the Times to claim that he had actually met Elizabeth Stride a few days before she had been murdered. At the time, Bernardo was campaigning to make it illegal for the keepers of common lodging houses to admit young children. Instead, he proposed that special shelters be set up exclusively for minors. He decided to find out how this would be viewed by that class of unhappy women who had no abode but the common lodging house. And so, one night in late September, he visited 32 Flower and Dean Street, where Elizabeth Stride was lodging. He detailed his experience in his letter to the Times. In the kitchen, there were many persons, some of them being girls and women of the same unhappy class as that to which poor Elizabeth Stride belonged. The company soon recognised me, and the conversation turned upon the previous murders. The female inmates of the kitchen seemed thoroughly frightened at the dangers to which they were presumably exposed. In an explanatory fashion, I put before them the scheme which had suggested itself to my mind, by which children, at all events, could be saved from the contamination of the common lodging houses and the streets, and so, to some extent, the supply cut off, which feeds the vast ocean of misery in this great city. The pathetic part of my story is that my remarks were manifestly followed with deep interest by all the women. Not a single scoffing voice was raised in ridicule or opposition. One poor creature, who had evidently been drinking, exclaimed somewhat bitterly to the following effect. We're all up to no good, and no one cares what becomes of us. Perhaps some of us will be killed next. And then she added, If somebody had helped the likes of us long ago, we would never have come to this. Impressed by the unusual manner of the people, I could not help noticing their appearance somewhat closely, and I saw how evidently some of them were moved. I have since visited the mortuary in which were lying the remains of the poor woman stride, and I at once recognised her as one of those who stood around me in the kitchen of the common lodging house on the occasion of my visit last Wednesday week. Bernardo was so moved by this first-hand experience that he promptly purchased a property in Flower and Dean Street and converted it into a licensed common lodging house for young girls. From the day it opened, each bunk was filled every night. So there you have 10 strange facts about Jack the Ripper. Obviously, a selection like this is a personal choice and you might have your own favourite fact that wasn't included. Please do share it with us in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, to watch other videos such as this, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, I do hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and do have a great day. Goodbye.